Hey everyone, and welcome to Eastside Online. As always, our mission here at Eastside, it's about conforming lives to the likeness of Jesus. We want everybody that's here on site, everybody that's here online with us, we want all of our lives to be conformed more and more to be like Jesus each and every day. And we are glad that you guys are here to join us this weekend. We are just coming off of Easter weekend here at Eastside. We had an incredible weekend last week and we are so glad that you are returning. If you're new and maybe you just jumped on last week and found us, thank you for being here. We're glad that you're here with us. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, there's a connect card link in the comment section. Right now you can click on that with Cindy free journal just to say thank you for connecting with us. We have an incredible service today that is mapped out. We have worship. We're going to take communion together here in just a little bit. We're going to continue in our GOAT vote, the greatest of all time. So if you've not downloaded the Eastside app, make sure to jump on your app store and do that today. We're going to be doing that here in just a little bit on the Eastside app. And also we have our student pastor, Luke Wanger, bringing the word today. We are continuing the series, The Greatest of All Time, The Goat. We're going to learn more about it today. We're glad that you're here. Let's worship together. Did I search the world? It couldn't fill me. There's empty praise, treasures that fade. Never know. Come on. Then you came along. Yeah. You put me back together. Yeah. Every desire is now satisfied. Here in your love. Don't make me sing about myself. Let's lift it up. Come on. And this nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Hey. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Come on. If you believe that, sing that out tonight, amen. I'm not afraid. Show you my. My failures and flaws, Lord, you see them all. You still call me friend. The God of the mountain. Cause the God of the mountain. Is still the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.
At this time in our service, we're going to take communion together. And each and every week at Eastside, we do this to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. Would you pray? Father, thank you for this day. God, thank you for the ultimate sacrifice of your son on the cross. We thank you that Jesus went to the cross willingly um, and, and took that punishment, the pain, and everything that he endured on our behalf. God, thank you for sacrificing your son for us and what it means to us. God, we love you and thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, you say that we have access to you, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells within us. We're just going to ask for that right now, Jesus. Because all we have to do is just ask, seek, not watch the door sleep wide open. Roll back that stone. Roll back that stone. Roll back that stone. Roll so all we have to do is just ask, see, knock, watch the door, see, wide open, roll back that stone, roll back oh. that stone, roll back that stone, roll back that stone. Nothing 
What's up, East Side? Go ahead and get out your phone and phone because it is time for the GOAT vote, the greatest of all time. And today we are talking about the greatest of all time streaming services. If one of your favorite is not one of these three, I don't know what to tell you. You're just wrong, okay? We got Netflix versus Hulu versus Disney Plus. We all know Netflix is known for that show that's based in the 80s. It's got 11, it's got her merry band of friends. It is called. That's right, Stranger Things. Then we got Hulu, Bob's Burgers, Nuff Said, probably the most appropriate, hilarious adult cartoon of all time. So I don't need, hey, there's a movie coming out. We're not, we're not sponsored by it, but it is dropping soon. So hey, Hulu, Bob's Burgers, you know what I'm saying? Now listen up, Disney Plus has also got a lot of stuff, a lot of heavy hitters. You got Marvel, you got Star Wars, you got all those shows that your kids probably watch. All of these and more. Remember, get your phone, go to our app, put a vote, and you're gonna see the results of the winner here very soon. Can't wait to see it. Go vote for the greatest of all time streaming services. Bye. Um, so here we go. Go vote. Let's see if the results are in. Let's see if the results are in. Here we go. 53% to Netflix. Let me hear you if you voted for Netflix. Okay. All right. You know what? I'm actually really proud of you. Because I thought this vote was going to be like 90% Netflix. All my students texted me back and they said, dude, we're watching Netflix and the Netflix is the streaming service of choice. Uh, each week we start out with this vote just for fun, but to point us back to this series on Jesus being the greatest of all time. And Jesus in the book of John, seven different times made a statement of him being the greatest of all time. And, and over the past six weeks, uh, including Easter weekend, we've talked through those statements. Uh, Pastor Dave has done an incredible job at communicating those things. And you know what, guys? Uh, we need to take a moment here. Just to say, we need to take a moment 
and just give it up for Pastor Dave. He's taking a little time off this week. Give it up for our pastor. I, I, I intentionally picked the week, weekend after Easter because I knew one, Dave was going to be worn out, and two, uh, this was the best uh, goat topic of the series, okay? So I'm going to bring it tonight, if that's okay. Is that okay with you guys? All right. Okay, I'm going to bring it, and uh, I'm just going to ask that God be speaking through me because t- tonight's all about Jesus being the name above all names. It's not about, uh, it's not about me and it's not about what, what we feel about Jesus. It's about who he is and what he promises. Amen? Amen. So pray with me. Bow your head. Let's pray uh, and just ask God to bless this before we jump in deep into this topic tonight. God, we love you. and We thank you for your son, Jesus. God, we thank you that tonight we could come into this room, set aside time from busyness in life just to worship your name. God, I sensed and felt you moving in mighty ways in here. As we sang about the battle belonging to you. As we sang about, uh, just like Lazarus coming out of that tomb, you you have resurrected us, God. You've made us new, and, and, and you're using us today for your glory. So God, I ask that the words that I speak would not be from a piece of paper. God, I ask that the words that I speak would be from your heart and that your Holy Spirit would guide, would direct, would transform us tonight. And God, I believe that you're gonna do a special work in your people if we believe you are who you say you are. So help us believe that and help us live that out. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Okay, so tonight, Jesus comes full force as he gets ready to go into his final discourse, okay? His final discourse, Jesus is getting ready to go into that time where he's gonna be taken by Roman soldiers, he's gonna be put on trial, he's gonna be mocked, he's gonna be beaten, crucified, Uh, eventually he's gonna rise from the grave like we celebrate at Easter. But as we build up to that point, Jesus is spending time with the people that he loved the most. And and you all know who that was. That was the 12 disciples. Jesus is spending time with them. And as throughout Jesus' ministry, he just drops these I am statements into his disciples and into the people he's preaching to so that they will see not him alone, but that they will see God through Jesus. Because Jesus is the visible image of God. So I don't, I don't know where everybody's at here and online in your faith, but uh, sometimes it can be difficult to separate, like, I believe in Jesus, but I don't really understand who God is, or, yeah, I, 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 I have this honor and this reverence for God, but I don't know if I, I, I understand how to really follow Jesus. Tonight, we get to talk about what Jesus was as God in the flesh. And, and before we do that, I want to go real quick where we've been. The past five weeks, we've looked at these things about Jesus. We've looked at Jesus being the bread, the sustenance. We've looked at Jesus being the light that overcomes the darkness. We've looked at Jesus as the door or the gate that we enter through. We've looked at Jesus as the great shepherd whose sheep hear his voice. And then Easter weekend, praise Jesus for what Jesus was doing here. Easter weekend, we talked about Jesus being the resurrection and, and, and I don't know about you guys, but I, I could just keep resonating this week on what Pastor Dave said last week, that, that come home statement when he said, hey, sometimes we celebrate, sometimes we trust, but we always follow Jesus. Amen? We always follow Jesus. There are times in our lives where we can celebrate what God is doing. There's times where we don't feel like celebrating. And so we just have to trust. But in everything we do, we have to follow Jesus. And that's why I'm so excited about this message tonight because Jesus is going to proclaim this great statement of who he is. He's in the upper room with his disciples. These are some of the final moments that Jesus has with his disciples. Tonight we get to see that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth in the life, but I want to zero in on Jesus as the way. 
What does that mean? Jesus is the way. Let me give you guys a little bit of context for where Jesus is at in his ministry here. Um, we're going to be in John 14, verse 1 through 6 tonight. So you can put, put that up on your Bible or your Bible app, or we'll have it up on the screen. But here in John 14, and then continuing in 15 and 16, Jesus is preparing his disciples for life after he leaves. So the disciples really didn't understand, even though they were all in for Jesus, they watched him do miracles, some of them performed those miracles, they, they gave up everything to follow him. The disciples didn't fully understand that Jesus was going to leave them. They didn't fully understand that Jesus was gonna actually depart from their life. Because like, like many of, the, the, of God's people at that time, they thought Jesus was gonna come and rule and reign as a king with authority over uh, political environments and over authority over people that were their enemies. But Jesus turned that completely upside down and Jesus was the king that was a servant. He was a king that was humble. He was a king that when he was just hours away from going to the cross, here with his disciples, just hours away, when the disciples should have been comforting him, they should have been consoling him and praying for him, Jesus is the one who's giving comfort. Jesus is the one who's being kind, he's being understanding. He's being encouraging. And, and, and in John, the book of John, Jesus, this is what I love about the book of John, Jesus shows us the depth of God's love for you. The depth of God's love for you. And he does that not only through his actions, but his words. You know, there were some ways that Jesus was showing the disciples the love of God in these final moments leading up to his crucifixion. One of the ways Jesus was doing this was by washing their feet. Anybody here ever washed somebody's feet before? Right, okay, I, I wash my kids' feet in the bath, all right, when they're getting ready for bed and getting ready for school the next day. But when it comes to washing somebody's feet, like somebody that literally is walking outside all day in, in the shoes and the footwear that they would have worn that day, like that was a job for the lowest of low servants to wash the grime and the dirt. But Jesus said, this is, this is what it means to be like me. This is what it means to be a disciple. And he did that by washing their feet. The disciples didn't even feel worthy. They said, no, we need to wash your feet. Jesus said, let me show you what it looks like to serve. Uh, Jesus served his disciples uh, in a meal. He ate his last meal with the disciples. He wasn't with his family. He wasn't with uh, e even other people that he could have been uh, preaching the gospel. Jesus was with his disciples because that was his crew. That was his, that, that was his small group. That was the people that he did life with. If you don't have people like that in your life, you need to get into a life group. You need to jump into a small group where you can share meals together and you can share love together the way Jesus was sharing that with his disciples. And remember, Jesus is getting ready for his final moments of his life. He's eating a meal with them. Another thing Jesus was doing with his disciples was praying for them. And he wasn't just praying that, that God would protect them. He wasn't just praying that they do the right thing after he left. Jesus was praying that they would have unity. It's so important as believers that we unite together, not fight, not have conflict. So Jesus knew my people are gonna need unity. They're gonna need to be united together. So Jesus prayed for their unity. He prayed that they would love as he first loved them. And this is all in the upper room where Jesus is sharing this meal, he's praying for them, he's washing their feet, these final moments that Jesus has with his disciples, all leading up to this great statement of Jesus being the way. And there's so much packed into this, so I'm gonna read through uh, John 14, one through six with you, and then, and then we're gonna walk through what Jesus was showing his disciples of being the way. Starts out here in verse one. Jesus said this, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. 
If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way where I'm going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. There's so much packed in here into these six verses. As I prayed and studied and just, just took it in all week, I'm like, God, how do I not just talk about one thing tonight? How do I break down all this stuff? Because we're talking about Jesus saying, don't be troubled. Trust in me. We're talking about heaven. Uh, Jesus draws this picture of heaven as a place with many rooms, a mansion. We, we're talking about one of the disciples, Thomas, who was doubting. And Jesus makes this statement. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he doesn't even just leave it there. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. That was a lot to think through, the process through. And, and I'm like, God, how do you want us to learn from that? How do you want your people to be fully engaged with who you are as the way? And I think we gotta start with first one. We gotta start at the beginning because it's a matter of the heart. Everybody here, everybody watching online has matters of the heart. Things that you hold dear to you things that are important to you, things that you may struggle with, people you may love deeply. Those are all matters of the heart. And Jesus says in verse one to his disciples, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. So Jesus actually starts out this, this beginning of this passage with a command. He says, don't. He's saying, stop. Stop. And, it, and it's in a commanding type way. The, the Greek word here for don't, I'm going to completely botch the way this is pronounced, but I, I believe it's me teresio, and it means stop being troubled. So Jesus was literally telling his disciples, stop being troubled. No more. No more worry. No more fear. No more anxiety. No more pain. And this is speaking to the disciples right after Jesus has uh, told them about his crucifixion. This is right after Jesus ha has told them that someone in the room is going to betray him. And that's Judas before he walks out of the room. The disciples still were confused, but surely they were catching on. Oh my goodness. Jesus is talking about being crucified. He's talking about his life being taken. He's, he's talking about someone in here, one of the 12, would, would betray him. And Jesus doesn't stop there. He actually talks about how the disciples would deny him. Even Peter, the one who walked on water, the one who said, Jesus, I will do anything for you. I will not let them take you. I will serve you forever. He said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before I pass. Three times. That's, it. That's how hard it, it's going to be for you to love Jesus. And so my question for you here in verse one is, can you relate with that? Can you relate with how hard it is to love Jesus sometimes? In the world we live in, the people we're around, the things, the influences around us that try to take our time, our attention, our focus, our family. Jesus says, don't be troubled, stop completely but I love that Jesus isn't just being commanding. He isn't just being authoritative. Jesus, on the back of every command he gives, there's a promise. And if all of us grew up with uh, people that told us what to do, parents as, uh, when you're young, or, or bosses as you grow up and get into your careers, if we grew up with people that said, hey, uh, I, you gotta do what I say, stop doing that, do this, but there was always a promise of something good behind it, we'd probably do better, right? I know I would, I would. If I knew there was a promise behind every command that I was given, it might be easier for me to follow those things sometimes. And you know, I remember a promise that my parents made me growing up. Anybody here ever had promises that their parents made them growing up? 
Yeah. So I, I remember a promise that my parents made me growing up. Uh, we, we didn't take vacations a lot. Uh, we didn't go out to eat a lot because we had a family of seven, okay? And, and if, if you know my family, I have three girls, uh, six, five, and a newborn. And so I, I, God gave me girls because I grew up with four sisters, okay? So big family. We didn't go out and do things a lot of times. Money was kind of tighter. And, 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 and one of the things that, that, that happened was uh, our parents made us this promise. They said, hey, we're going to go on a family trip to Montana. And I loved Montana. I think I'd been there once or twice. I loved it. Loved being in the outdoors. Loved being in the mountains. And our, and our parents said, hey, we're going to go to Montana this summer. But to do that and to have the fun we want you to have so we can enjoy the trip, we're not going to go out to eat anymore on Sundays after church. No more eating out after Sundays after church. I, I don't know what it's like for everybody in this room, but I know for me, halfway through the sermon, I was always thinking about what I was gonna eat, okay? Right, sometimes we're like, come on, let's go, let's go, right? Meals are something we share together, we enjoy that, okay? But for us, Sundays were special because that was one of the, the usually the only times in the week that we went out to eat as a family. But our parents said, hey, we're not gonna do that for about six months. We're like, what? Come on. We can't go to pizza with our friends. We can't have this one day where we go eat Chinese food with everybody. But our parents said, hey, every time that we don't go out to eat, we're going to put 40, I think it was $40. Back then you could eat as a family of seven for $40, okay? Now, ba now barely two people can eat for that. Um, but uh, ba back, back then it was, it was, we put $40. They said, we're going to put $40 in this jar and we're going to leave this jar in the kitchen so everybody can see it. And we're just going to, we're going to save up that money for our trip. And when we get to our trip, we're going to divide it equally. They told us equally. I'm sure it wasn't divided equally. Um, but they said, we're going to divide it equally so that you'll have money to buy souvenirs, to spend most of it on gas stations on the way there and back. But the command and the, the decision of no more eating out on Sundays... Not, not for a season, was, was met with a promise. And they, they followed through with, this, with that promise. Now, I don't know about you. I, I don't know if, uh, if Jesus, if Jesus was, was handing us money or, or giving us something like that physically every time if we'd obey him, if we'd have a lot or we'd be dead broke. But what Jesus, I believe, is teaching us is the same thing that I was taught as a kid in that situation that there's something good on the other side of following a command, of trusting, of obeying. And I, and I wanna bring us back for the rest of this service, I wanna bring us, bring us back to this one thing and that's this, Jesus is the only way home. Jesus is the only way home. The passage, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, we're talking about Jesus being the way, but I wanna talk about Jesus being the only way back home. What is home? What's the promise? Jesus is saying, don't be troubled. Trust in me. Believe in me as you believe in God. But we gotta see what he means when he says home. Verses two and three say this. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be where I am. Jesus begins to talk about home and it's not an earthly place. You guys know what it is, it's heaven. Heaven is our home. Heaven is the place that we were designed to be. With Jesus. Heaven is the place we were created for. Heaven is the place that Jesus says, I'm preparing this place for you. The Father's preparing this place for you, and your name is gonna be on a door. You're gonna have a room. And not only are you gonna have a room, Jesus says, There's many rooms in this mansion, there's many rooms. There's an abundance of rooms so that more people can come into that relationship with Jesus, can join Jesus in heaven. 
Jesus speaks of heaven being home. Now, my two older girls, Ireland and Finley, they're six and five. Uh, one thing they love to do at home is they love to build forts, okay? Does anybody here uh, have kids that like to build forts? Okay, or maybe as a kid, you've done that for? For me, building a fort was going out to the woods and building a real fort, okay? It wasn't blankets and stuffed animals and watching Encanto, okay? But building a fort is something my girls love to do, okay? They don't love to clean it up, but they love to build the fort. So they get their blankets, all the blankets in the house. They get all their stuffed animals, headbands, toys. Drives me nuts. Drives me nuts to clean up this stuff. But why do they do that? Why do they create those forts? Why do they build those things? It's because they have a childlike heart. It's because they have a creative mind. It's because at six and five, they're their own master craftsmen for their product, the fort. They they create these forts as an ideal place to play, watch movies, even sleep in. And I think about that. I think about my own kids and, and the work they put into that. And it made me think about what Jesus is doing for us in heaven. That's what Jesus is doing for us in heaven. He says, I have a place for you. I have rooms for you. It's a mansion. It's something you can't even imagine. And there's more than enough room. That part really hit me this week. The part where it says there's more than enough room. And it made me wonder this. Why wouldn't we want to go get more people to go there with us? Why wouldn't we want to get more people to go there with us? That is the mission of Eastside, conforming lives to the likeness of Jesus. Jesus didn't prepare a place in heaven, a mansion for us, so that we would just, oh man, I got this checked off. Got got baptized, went to Pathway. Make sure and go to Pathway, okay? Um, You know, follow, uh, read my Bible when I can. You know, this that, man, I got my place. No, Jesus created us for more than that. So why wouldn't we go get more people? Who's your one? Who's your person you need to get for that room that Jesus has prepared them for? Who's that person that needs to come back home to Jesus? Jesus is the only way home. He's the only way home. The disciples in this moment needed to hear this, even if they didn't fully understand it until Jesus was gone. They need to understand that there's a hope in heaven. And church, I don't know what your view is of heaven. I don't know what it will be after tonight, but I know this for me, for my heart, for my soul, for what drives me, I know that our community I know that our cities, I know that our schools, I know that our neighbors, I know that our coworkers need the room that Jesus has for them, amen? He needs the room to be for them. We're all part of that together. And what does it do for us? What did it do for the disciples to understand heaven in this way? I, I, think, I think that this quote by Charles Spurgeon, a great theologian, someone who loved God so much, brings it all together. Charles Spurgeon said this, little faith will bring your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Little faith. Remember Jesus said that in his ministry. He said, ye have little faith. Little faith will bring your soul to heaven. But great faith will bring heaven to your soul. What does it look like for you to leave this service and have a great faith? You got to recognize Jesus is the only way home. He's the only way to heaven. He's the only way to the Father. Imagine what life change you'd see in yourself. Imagine what life change you'd see in others around you as it bleeds out into them. If you turned your trouble, your anxiety, your fear, your worries, all things that the disciples had and they walked with Jesus. Don't beat yourself up for for suffering through those things. But, But know that Jesus wants you to have a great faith. Jesus wants you to have a great faith. 
so that heaven can be brought to your soul? What would we look like as a church if we had heaven in our souls every moment we lived and breathed, not just in this room, not just online, but every moment that we lived? Jesus goes on to say in verses four and five, this to Thomas. He says this. He says, you know the way where I'm going. He says to the disciples, you know the way. The way's through me. The way's through the Father. And Thomas says this. Thomas says, now we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? How can we know the way to God? How can we know the way home with Jesus to heaven and know our mission here if we have a doubt like Thomas does? And you know, I, Thomas always gets a bad rap. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Thomas as being referred to as Doubting Thomas, but that's who he's known to be in the Bible. I think there's three different instances in the Bible where Thomas is, is asking a question or he's, he's doubting something. The dude gets a bad rap. He gets a bad rap, right? Are you a doubting Thomas? Are you a doubting Thomas? Are you the guy who doesn't, or the girl who doesn't get picked, who doesn't get recruited, who doesn't get the look because maybe you have a doubt or you're struggling with believing in something that you need to follow? Are you in that boat? Because Jesus speaks directly to Thomas. Jesus doesn't pass over Thomas and say, Thomas, get on out of the room, man. I'm getting ready to go give my life and you're doubting me. Jesus is right there with Thomas. He's right there in Thomas's doubt. And doubt, doubt can be something that, that can keep us so far from God. But we have to deal with our doubts. Craig Rochelle, pastor of Life Church, says this about doubt. He says, your doubts handled properly can actually be a catalyst to your faith. What does that mean to handle your doubts properly? Well, I think like Thomas, we have to, we have to get that out. We have to share that. We have to be doing life with people. We have to be the one person in the room that says, I don't get that. Thomas said, uh, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Uh, how do we know the way? Imagine what the disciples were thinking. Like, Thomas, why are you asking this stuff, man? Just like follow along. Just, just keep going with it. Thomas is the guy that asked the question that everybody's probably thinking. Thomas is the guy that digs down deep into his doubts. And I, I wanna ask you this, have you ever been in a place in your life, now, in the past? Have you ever been in a place in your life where you doubted God? Where you doubted his plan? Where trusting in Jesus was really just not for you? Trusting in Jesus was just too hard one of my friends and mentors in life, the things that he stuck, that thing that he said, he said this thing to me years ago that stuck with me forever in a message. He said, your faith can't be dictated by your circumstances. Your faith can't be dictated by your circumstances. When you go through hard things, if your faith is little, you will waver, you will struggle. You'll be like Thomas here and you may not do anything with your doubt but your circumstances should show your faith. Thomas had questions. Thomas was someone that Jesus came for. Jesus came for Thomas. He didn't skip over him, just like he doesn't skip over the doubters, just like he doesn't skip over the criminals, just like he doesn't skip over the skeptics, just like he didn't skip over his disciples when they denied him. Jesus came to serve. Jesus came to serve, and he said this in verse six. Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus is responding to Thomas here. He's saying, Thomas, hey, I'm the way. I'm the way. You doubt, but I'm the way. I'm right here in front of you. 
believe in me, follow me, trust in me. There's something great that I've promised you, a hope of heaven. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to send the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to comfort you. Jesus responds to Thomas, I believe, in a very bold way with this statement of, I am the only way, Thomas. I'm the only way. I'm the only way home. And he makes this statement that disregards any other religion or faith. Jesus is the only way to God. He's the only way to God. He does that without reservation. And that's something that we have to believe. He's the only way. If we miss that, we miss everything that Jesus did. If we walk out of here doubting that Jesus is not the way and not dealing with those doubts and insecurities and anxieties and fears, then we'll be kept from trusting Jesus with our life. And Jesus said at the end of that verse, no one can come to the Father except through me. What did he, what did, what did he mean by no one? Nobody. Not a single person can come, to G, can come to the Father except through me. And that's because Jesus came as, as perfectly God in human form to set us free from our sin. He had to be perfect through all the doubt, through all the neglect, through his journey to the cross to grant us forgiveness and righteousness. The only way to Jesus, the only way home is through Jesus, the only way. But there's something that exists that keeps us from God. There's something that exists that keeps us from God. And, and, and I, I wanna show you guys in, in just kind of a literal picture format here what that looks like. Because we got God over here, perfect God, omnipotent, omnipresent, all-knowing, all-powerful, the creator of the world. And then over here is us. Over here is us. It's me. And there's a space here. There's a chasm. There's a gap. There's no way for us to get to God. There's just a valley of darkness. So how do we get to God? How do we get to the one who's holy, who's pure, who's on the throne? How do we draw close to God so that we can be better in our faith, so we can have great faith? What do we do with the chasm set before us? God set it into motion in John three sixteen. He loved the world and he sent his only son Jesus, Jesus is the only way home. Jesus is the only way to God. And if you think that Jesus came to modify your sin or regulate your sin or say, hey, if you do these things, you get to heaven. But if you do these things, you know, th th there's, there's kind of a line there. Jesus didn't come to regulate or modify your sin or say, man, that's okay, but that's not. We're dead wrong if we believe that. Dead, dead wrong, as Dave would say. Dead, dead wrong. Jesus didn't come to modify our sin. Sin isn't something that makes us bad. And that's typically what we feel. If we sin, we do something bad. Sin doesn't make us bad, church. Sin makes us dead. We're dead if we're in sin. We are dead. There is the chasm between us. But Jesus came to make you alive. So it's time that we stop thinking that our sin is something we beat ourselves up for. Our sin is something that just makes us bad, but then we can come before God and we can be good for a while and then we can be bad again. No, it doesn't work that way. It's either you're dead or you're alive. Jesus was the visible God on this earth and he showed us who God is, a God of life. A God who's prepared a place for us. A God who sent Jesus to be the only way for us to get home. We were made for the home that Jesus prepared for us. You know, about a month ago, I was uh, uh, with my wife getting ready to come home from the hospital with, with our baby girl, Holland. 
And, and, and as we were getting ready to come home from the hospital, we were there for about three days. Um, my girls had been with some friends and, and some people that were supporting us and loving us and just taking care of them. You know, they couldn't be in the hospital with us, with the, with the new baby. And, and when the girls came home and sleepless nights and lots of diapers and chaos and craziness, um, in, in my mind and in, in my wife's mind, we thought uh, may, maybe we should find some more people that they can hang out with, things they can go do. That we wanted them to have fun. But our girls kept saying, no, we want to be home. We want to be home with you. There's nothing like being home. In this world, as good as it can be, as much as we've been blessed with, it's not our home, church. It's not our home. Home is with Jesus. So it's time that we pack our bags and go home with the way, the truth, in the life, amen? I mean, come on, think about the prodigal son. The prodigal son who left everything so he could live his life. And he realized, man, what a mistake I've made. I need to go home. And when I go home, I, I feel worthless. I've doubted. I have this fear. And so the prodigal son thought to himself, man, I, I'll, I'll just be a lowly servant. Maybe then my father will accept me back into the home. But what did the father do? He ran to him. He embraced him. He celebrated his son coming home because that's the picture of what Jesus is for us. He's the only way home. And God loves Jesus so much and loved us so much that he would even turn his back on his son so that we could come home so that we could embrace that. You were made for a home and that's not here. That's a home being prepared for you with Jesus, but we have to start following Jesus as the way and the only way back to God. Would you pray with me? God, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that he made the only way home. God, in all your greatness and all your glory and all your wonder, your people, us, we let you down. We were dead in our sin. God, I was dead in my sin. No hope, no way home. But you sent Jesus to be the hope for your creation. You sent Jesus for me. So God, help us as a church to go out and live like you are the only way to the Father. You are the only way home. And help us bring as many people as we can with us so that they can experience the place you have for them, the room you have for them. We ask these things in your name. All right, guys, we have one more week of the GOAT series, the greatest of all time. Pastor Dave will be back with us next week, and we can't wait to hear what he has to say to wrap this series up. But man, Luke brought the word today. We're so proud of you, man. Thank you for sharing God's word with us. We love you guys. We hope that you join us next week. See you then.